The coalition government in Pakistan has disintegrated. It drove Musharraf from power. Now it's at the center of a power struggle itself. As the violence escalates and the economy dwindles, Pakistan's people ask, which way now? This is Inside Story. Hello there, I'm Shuli Ghosh. Former Pakistani Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif has pulled his party out of the ruling coalition. The reason for the split, the row over the reinstatement of the judiciary and who should be the next president. The division between Sharif and the PPP leader Asif Ali Zadari has created fresh political uncertainty in Pakistan as it heads towards presidential elections on September the 6th. From Islamabad, Mike Hanna has this report. A decision after days of wrangling, Nawaz Sharif announces his Muslim League is pulling out of government. We deep regret today when we have no hope from all sides, when we have no cooperation. With a heavy heart, we have decided to split from the People's Party. It's a move that impacts directly on the role that Parliament will play in the weeks ahead. A parliament in which no party can muster the two-thirds majority needed to amend a constitution that at present gives sweeping powers to an executive president. After the February elections, this was a picture of parliament. Out of the total of 340 occupied seats, the governing coalition held 286, the bulk drawn from the two major parties. The opposition held 54. But now the PMLN has pulled out, things have changed. The governing coalition has 195 seats. The opposition, joined by Nawaz's Muslim League, has 145. The significance is the government no longer has the two-thirds majority needed to amend the constitution. If PPP leader Asif Ali Zadari wins the presidential election in less than two weeks' time, he'll have sweeping powers. The same that he and his party were so critical of Pervez Musharraf for wielding, including the power to dissolve parliament. The judges constitute one body that could declare the amendments unconstitutional, but the judiciary too is in disarray. The judges who were fired last year remain fired. This despite an apparent agreement that they would be reinstated within 24 hours of Professor Musharraf's resignation. And now civil society is likely to enter the fray. The powerful lawyers movement threatening to mount public protests this week unless the judges are returned to office immediately. It was they who spearheaded the protests that led to the return of exiled politicians like Zadari and Sharif and ultimately resulted in Professor Musharraf's resignation. When he walked away, it seemed that democracy had triumphed. But at this stage, the sweeping presidential powers that all expected to disappear, along with the Musharraf era, remain firmly in place. Mike Hanna, Al Jazeera, Islamabad. Well, let's discuss some of those issues. Joining us now are our guests in Islamabad, Humayun Gohar, a writer best known for helping former President Musharraf write his autobiography. Also in Islamabad, Maria Kusisto. She's an expert on Pakistani affairs with the Eurasia Group. And in Kabul, Musharraf Zaidi. He's a journalist with The News International, one of Pakistan's leading newspapers. Thank you very much indeed uh, for your time. Um, well, this isn't a surprise, is it? Let me come to you first, Musharraf. Did Sharif back himself to, to a corner? Didn't he see this coming? Mm, I don't. I don't know if uh, if he did. I mean, before we get into that sort of discussion, I have to sort of take exception to the constant sort of uh, description of what's happening in Pakistan as a collapse and a disaster and a destruction of the coalition. I think that things are back uh, in their natural order the way they should be. Um, what the I natural think that order the is political instability. Well, any democracy is uh, fundamentally unstable. Let's remember who we're talking about here. Sharif and Zardari are not Hillary and Barack. Sharif and Zardari are McCain and Barack. The, this is the Democrats versus the Republicans. It's, uh, you know, it was always an unnatural alliance to begin with. So I think it's actually good news for Pakistan that it's actually going to have a functional opposition. Uh, for about six months now, we've had a government that has had no opposition. And, uh, you know, that's, I mean, at least in my definition of democracy, that's just unnatural. Okay, well, let's talk about that. Uh, Maria Cusisto, um, Sharif has said that he's going to play the role of constructive opposition. He says he doesn't want to destabilize the government. What do you take that to mean? 
Well, I, I don't think that that is going to be the case. I think um, Navas Sharif, um, you know, prepared this departure from the from the coalition quite carefully, and I think he's actually quite annoyed what happened over the past few days, and he was particularly annoyed that that Sadari wasn't respecting the agreements that he made with Navas Sharif, and also he was annoyed that that uh, Sadari went and, and and declared that he would seek presidency. So I think you know, in that sense, he's now it's a payback time, and he will take a very aggressive role in in the opposition. But, but, it, but it's one thing to be annoyed and to stand on your principles. It's quite another to be marginalized. Has Sharif unintentionally done that? Well, I don't think that uh, Nawaz Sharif is marginalized. I think you have to take into account that he ha his popularity is actually very, very strong. He's the only national leader left after Ben Arsid Bhutto's assassination in December 2007. And he has actually, you know, been very, very consistent with his uh, demands. And he is, is actually promoting very populist agenda. And that is actually very infectious here in Pakistan. And his popularity is increasing. So I think he's going to pose a very tough challenge to Sadari. Okay, let me come to uh, you, Humayun, in uh, Islamabad. I mean, uh, to a lot of people, it seemed uh, clear that these kind of fundamental uh, divisions were going to happen because, uh, particularly, the promise over the judiciary. How could Zadari replace a judiciary uh, which might then revoke the amnesty he'd received for allegations of corruption? Yeah, we seem to be concentrated on that, which is correct. I mean, uh, the supposition is not necessarily wrong that he was hesitant about doing that because it might revoke the NRO under which he got the amnesty. <clears throat> but you see, there was a certain degree of duality in the demand of uh, both the lawyers as well as uh, Mr. Nawaz Sharif. Now, if you look at the Bourbon Declaration, which they signed to form the coalition government, that says that the old deposed judiciary will be uh, restored after a resolution in Parliament. But then the same declaration goes on to say that we will adhere to the Charter of Democracy uh, signed earlier in letter and spirit. Now the Charter of Democracy says we will have no truck ever again anything to do with any of the judges of any PCO. So Mr. Zardari can quite rightly claim that look I was going according to the char Charter, the spirit of the Charter and Mr. Nawaz Sharif can claim I was going according to the spirit of the Bourbon Declaration. So there is this duality there. Now if, for example, they had all said, including the lawyers to begin with, exactly what the Charter of Democracy says, that we want the independence of the judiciary and we will have nothing to do with either these PCO judges of 2007 or the judges of 2000. Well, then I think they would have gathered a lot of steam. Let, let's just talk about that, but, that concept uh, just of... Just to say that it was just the NRO was not enough. Let, let's talk about the concept of, of democracy, because Zadari has obviously accepted his party's nomination for presidency. Um, first of all, doesn't that go against the pact he agreed for a non-partisan candidate? And secondly, is he really wanting to amend the constitution to remove powers from the president if he becomes the president? Hmm, of course he will not. Look, in politics, and especially our kind of politics, these pacts and signatures don't mean anything. I mean, I was a bit amused that day to see uh, Mr. Nawaz Sharif raising those pieces of three or two or three, four pages and insisting that, you know, my signature and Mr. Zardari's signature is on every page he insisted. I mean, so what? I mean, when he went into exile, he signed a deal and he denied it for years and years and years. And then finally it reappears in the Supreme Court, his signature, his brother's signature, others are on it. And then he says, no, it's not for 10 years, it's for five years. I mean, did you even see what you were signing? So, you know, these, I don't know why we take these packs and signatures and pieces of paper so seriously. These guys don't mean it. And it's our problem. You see, we are naive when they sign something and we take it really seriously that they're going to take it as the divine word and they're going to implement it. They're actually fooling each other and they're fooling ourselves. That's all. Mr. Zardari said he would bring the constitutional amendment to buy time from Nawaz Sharif. That's all. Of course, as he, when he becomes president, why should he give up what uh, Mike Hanna called sweeping powers of, uh, uh, you know, dissolving the assembly? I don't think anyone quite realizes what the president of Pakistan is. He is the head of state. He is the supreme commander of the armed forces. He is the commander-in-chief of the army, the navy, and the air force. He is the symbol of the unity of the federation and the continuity of the state. And most importantly, while everyone is looking at the past to dissolve the assembly, they forget 
he is the chairman of the national command authority i.e he has the final say in the deployment and the use of nuclear weapons okay well, or if you want me to be dramatic he will have his finger on the nuclear button well that is pretty dramatic let me let me put and that I think to america Mishara. and the west no no i think they should be just a minute i think they should be very happy america always said that they fear was that they will fall into the hands of extremists now they will come under a president who according to america is a national party he heads head of a national party which is secular which is liberal which is westernized well, let, let me ask Musharraf Zaidi because I Musharraf has, has uh, written um, about Zadari no matter how much Zadari is disliked he's no worse than any other president of Pakistan I know you've been listening to what uh, hamayan has been saying there what kind of president do you think Zadari would make uh, Zardari will make a president that is a reflection and a representation of the will of the people of Pakistan. I think uh, Humayun Saab uh, and many others in, in Pakistan have gotten used to the idea of a smooth-talking, uh, smooth-walking, uh, you know, sophisticated and articulate man who talks uh, the language that Humayun Saab and the rest of the sort of English-speaking elite in Pakistan speak. But uh, Musharraf never had the kind of power and influence over people that Zardari had the day that he took over the party. Um, you know, right after the assassination of Shaheed Motarma, uh, Zardari was the one that actually helped keep the federation together. I'm, I've never been a fan of Zardari myself, uh, and I think, I think you know, my writing uh, has, has reflected that. But I think the point that we're missing here is that it doesn't matter whether we like Zardari or not. Zardari leads the most powerful and largest political party in the country. And it's, uh, I think it's a good omen that the, that, the, that the head of that party is going to be the head of the state. Okay, and I think the other political parties, Nawaz Sharif... Uh, sorry uh, to sorry. interrupt you. I just want to put I, a quick was... question to, to, to Maria uh, as, as we come to the end of, of part one. I mean, what, what, is, what is Nawaz Sharif going to do? I mean, he's fielding his own candidate. Uh, he's now going to be reaching out to the other political parties for support, isn't he? Well, of course, he's hoping that, you know, his man could, could potentially challenge, Mushar, uh, uh, challenge Sadari's uh, uh, ambitions to become uh, president. But I think that's very unlikely. I think Sadari is going to have a fairly easy, easy sort of easy competition for the position. Um, but in terms of, you know, Sadari's uh, approach, I think, you know, he's now going to be focusing on, 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 on his government in Punjab, in the province of Punjab. And he'll be also focusing on, on trying to push Sadari towards uh, reinstating the judges and, you know, reinstating them on the basis that he wants. And also, also trying to push Sadari to, um, to basically pursue pro-democracy pro reforms on the, along the lines of the, of the declaration of democracy between the two parties. So that's what he has sort of left now. Okay. Um, stay with us, all three of you. We're going to take a, a very short break now. When we come back, how is this ongoing political uncertainty affecting the people of Pakistan? Stay with us.